Hi, I'm Will. I've just finished my second year studying physics at the University of Oxford and I'm modelling on the Oxford iGEM team 2015. And today I'm going to give you a tutorial on stochastic modelling. Stochastic modelling is, is used for any system where there are a small number of particles and when there's a random element involved. It's different to deterministic models which evolve simply according to the standard differential equations that we're used to. For example, we could go as basic as possible and say dx by dt is some constant speed c, which of course solves to our position, is our initial position, plus our speed times, I'll write dt, the amount of time that we leave it for. Um, the simplest way to introduce a random element into our system, to turn it into a stochastic model of the evolution of this particle, is just to add a random number into the equation. So dx by dt is c plus r, where we would say r is a randomly uh, distributed number, normally distributed, about zero. So the distribution of r would look something like this. And of course this would add a term r dt into our solution, and every time step we would compute a new random number r and add some number r dt onto our position, some number c dt onto our position, and we would get some kind of result looking a little bit like this. This is position, this is time. That's the simplest possible model we could do. But we could go a little bit further than this, and we could deal with systems which involve different species of particles that evolve into one another. So another method we can look at, which is very popular in biological system, is the Gillespie algorithm. It's a method for modelling systems stochastically. And the best way to look at it is to take an example. We'll try and take a simple one. We'll take a system which contains two types of particles, of A and of B, and A can react to form B, and B can react to form A, and we start with a certain amount of A and a certain amount of B, and we want to see how our system evolves. The first thing we need to know is how often a particle from A turns to a particle of B and vice versa. And when we're dealing with biological systems, we intuitively decide that the reaction rate, the amount that A changes to B, is dependent on the amount of A we've got. It's proportional to the number of particles of A present in the system. And the pro proportionality constant we're going to choose, we're just going to call K1. And so what we can write is that the change in time of B, dB by dt, equals K1 times A, which is not the complete picture, but this is the evolution of B from the reaction of A. Similarly, the backwards reaction will be proportional to how many B particles we have with the proportionality constant K2. So we can write dA by dt equals K2 times B. But what we've neglected to think about is, well, each of these equations are coupled, they're linked. And in fact, as B is produced, it also decays back into A. So we can complete these equations by adding in the bits that we've missed. And now we have our system of equations that we want to model. This is what uh, would be a deterministic model, um, and that is the system that we're going to look at. So the Gillespie algorithm tells us two things um, at each step we choose to involve, evolve our system. It tells us the amount of time we have to wait before a reaction happens. In our first case we were talking about uh, with the position and the random number we introduced, we decide on a time step delta t, which is where I wrote the delta in there, uh, at which we add a random uh, perturbation to our system. But that's not what actually happens, and so we want to try and get a good estimation for how long it's going to take before the next reaction occurs. And the second thing the Gillespie algorithm tells us is which reaction has occurred in that time. In this system, either A can transform to become B, or B can react to become A. And so to decide the time, what we do is we make an assumption about what the probability distribution of the times is going to look like. We say that it's going to be more likely for reactions to occur sooner than later. In fact, it's going to be exponentially uh, difficult to find a reaction that happens at really late times compared to the previous one. So we say that the probability of a reaction happening 
in a certain time falls asymptotically to zero. And we can even write the form of this. Um, so if I write T and probability of reaction, P of T, we can write the form of this as E to the minus something I'll call alpha naught times the time. And of course this will intercept at one and asymptotically approach zero. What do we choose um, for alpha naught? Well, the more likely our reactions are to occur, the steeper this is going to be, and the larger alpha naught is. In fact, what we say alpha naught is the sum of the propensities, where each propensity is the chance of each reaction happening. We would say that the chance of reaction A to B happening, I'll call alpha 1, is K1A, just like we had in our equations a moment ago. And the, and the um, chance for uh, the unnormalized chance for B to turn into A, the propensity alpha 2, we will say is K2B. And so alpha naught would be the sum of these two, K1A plus K2B. And what we're going to do is we're going to randomly pick a number between naught and 1. Say it lies here. We're going to pick the number in this range. And we're going to read off our graph where this intercepts. And we're going to call this time tau, the time we had to wait until the next reaction occurs. So what we've done is we've randomly um, sampled from our probability distribution to get the time that we wanted. And in fact, we can rearrange this equation where we're now writing e to the minus alpha naught times tau equals our random number, which I will call r1. We can rearrange to find the time tau that we need and get that tau equals 1 over alpha naught times the natural log of 1 over r1. And now we have the time we wait until the next reaction. The next thing we need to do is to decide which reaction has occurred. And again, we want to use a random number to decide this. What we're going to do is we're going to take a region, 0 to 1, and we're going to sample a random number in this range. We'll call it R2. And we're going to split this region into all the possible reactions that can occur. In this case, either A going to B or B going to A. And we will split them in the ratios defined by the propensities that we have calculated. So what we're going to do is we're going to put boundaries, uh, here just one boundary, and we will write the boundary as the proportion of the total propensity that that reaction takes up. So this one will be alpha 1 over alpha naught. In this range, we have the forwards reaction, A to B. By adding the 1 over alpha naught, we've normalized this to make sure that when we add our next part on, our next reaction, so alpha 1 plus alpha 2 over alpha naught, well, that's just 1. And so now we've completely split um, our range 0 to 1 into all the possible reactions that can occur. Um, in this case, we've seen that our random number, which uniformly sampled between 0 and 1, came out to lie in the backwards region. We say that in the time tau that we just calculated, uh, the reaction has occurred that B, a particle of B, has turned into a particle of A. So B is going to change to whatever B was, and we're going to subtract 1. And A is going to change from whatever A was, and we're going to add 1. And now we've completed a step of the algorithm, uh, the Gillespie algorithm. So here it is, the Gillespie algorithm in full. I've written it out in pretty much pseudocode so that you could go into your favorite computer software package and implement this straight away. There are five steps. The first one, uh, as we said, was to find two no uh, random numbers, R1 and R2, and they must be uniformly distributed in the range 0 to 1. The second thing we do is we calculate all of the propensities related to the reactions that are possible. So I've labeled them alpha i, one of, the, uh, one of them before was k1a, the other was k2b. Uh, and we also need to find alpha naught, which is the sum of all of these propensities. So in this case, um, k1a plus k2b. Once we've done that, we then need to calculate time tau, 
which as we said was 1 over alpha naught times the natural log of 1 over R1, which is the time that it took for that reaction to occur. For step 4, what I've written out is simply the generalised version of what we've just done when we split up our number range 0 to 1 into different regions depending on the j different possible reactions that can occur. And the boundaries between each of these regions occur at the sum up to a number called j, uh, or I've called j, uh, of all of uh, the, the first j propensities out of all of our possible propensities, divided by the normalizing constant alpha naught, the sum of the propensities. And you need to find where R2 has um, fallen within this region, between which two boundaries has it li uh, does it lie. And so that's why I've written out um, it must be somewhere between the sum from I equals 1 to J minus 1, the J minus 1 for propensity, um, normalized by 1 over alpha naught, must be between this and this plus the next propensity normalized by alpha naught. And that will decide which reaction has occurred. Finally, we implement the reaction, so change the um, values of say A and B, and we move the time from T to T plus tau, and we repeat steps one to five all over again until we're happy that we've left the system for long enough. And hopefully you can see that, uh, what I've just done, um, programming this particular system up in MATLAB. And that's the Gillespie algorithm in full. You can use this to deal with any system where you haven't got very many particles or where there's a random element and the variance uh, in what happens in our system it starts to become important. And we're using it uh, in our project to describe what's happening with the gene expressions of our particular biobricks that we're building. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see that up on the wiki. I hope this has been helpful. I hope that you can apply it to your own project. Uh, and that you definitely consider using stochastic modelling as a tool to aid your biochemists in designing their systems. Thank you very much. I've been Will.